You're listening to World Class from the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. We bring expertise on international affairs from Stanford's campus straight to you. I'm Michael McFall, host of World Class and director of the Freeman Spogli Institute. Today, we are discussing all things China, both past, present, and future. And in particular, maybe we'll get to how the coronavirus might affect relations between the United States and China going forward. First, we have with us Professor Ji Noi. She's in the Department of Political Science with me. She's also a senior fellow here at the Freeman Spogli Institute. She's the founding director of Stanford's China program, and she's also founding director of the Stanford Center at Peking University. We also have Dr. Thomas Finger here today, who directed Stanford's US-China relations program from 1981 to 1983. He then worked for the State Department and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and was Assistant Secretary for Intelligence and Research in both the Clinton and George W. Bush administrations. And he also was the Deputy Director of the National Intelligence for Analysis. He returned to Stanford after that and has been a fellow at FSI's Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center ever since then. Tom and Jean have just released a fantastic book uh, edited by them called Fateful Decisions, Choices That Will Shape China's Future. Uh, they have a fantastic list of, of scholars here that I hope we'll get into recognizing some of them. Uh, I highly recommend everybody to buy this book uh, if you're interested in China's economic, social, political, and foreign policy challenges uh, moving forward from today. Welcome to the podcast, both Gene and Tom. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Thank you Mike. You. Well, we have some really big, hard questions here, but let's jump right in. Uh, first, many people, including some in the Trump administration, by the way, seem to see China as an unstoppable juggernaut of ambitions, even plans to displace the United States as the preeminent power in the world. Do you all agree with that assessment? Do your authors in this volume agree with that assessment? Jean, let's start with you. Okay. Well, that's a really, you know, complicated question, and it's um, some of the assumptions behind that question is what prompted Tom and I to do this volume. It's a complicated question, um, but let me just answer it in parts. And I'll just say uh, at the very beginning that there is really no one clear answer. But let the, let's start with the unstoppable uh, juggernaut um, with ambitions. I will leave the ambitions part to Tom. So I'll start with the unstoppable. Is it unstoppable? I would say that our volume, all of the authors would say no, it's not unstoppable. Interesting, um, there was consensus on that. Yeah, uh, yes, I think that, um, that, that uh, I mean, Tom could disagree, but I think that all of us uh, think that China has tremendous resources, has ch achieved a tremendous amount in the 40 years that they have been uh, undergoing reform and opening. Right. Uh, but at the same time, what I think that such um, assumptions um, fail to realize is that China is facing an enormous number of challenges. Right. And in some ways, that the road ahead is much harder than the road they have traveled. And so we need to just, we all agree that China has made amazing strides, you know, engaging in record breaking growth over the last 40 years. Right. But one of the key points that our volume makes is that this model that has been so successful for the past 40 years, it's yeah. unclear that this model is going to continue to work in the way that it has. And um, we also want to say that, and this is something else that I think some people may not appreciate, that you know, China is seen as a very uh, successful case of reform. But in many ways, uh, China has managed its growth without fully reforming. It's essentially gotten tremendous mileage out of essentially tweaking the system that they inherited from the Mao period. Right. And, and so, um, you know, and the key part of that we saw during COVID 
that it it because it already had this amazing bureaucracy that was able to penetrate from Beijing all the way down to the lowest levels, and it can get things done. I.e., it builds a hospital in ten days, you know, right. things it's like this, and, and, and tests millions of people. Uh, but the but the key point here, and this is, I think, one of the key contributions of our volume, is that we point out in great detail the conditions under which China was able to grow as rapidly as it did in the first 40 years or so. Um, and we make very clear that the you know, external and internal situation has changed greatly. And so that it's already quite evident that the, um, um, both domestically and the global conditions are not what they were. And so, especially on the global front, I mean, right. particularly now with U.S.-China relations, you know, going to, to, to all-time um, <laughs> record lows in terms of uh, what may happen, um, that certainly countries like the United States or even Japan, other developed countries, uh, are not uh, fostering uh, China's development. On the contrary, it's, it's you know, frustrating in some ways. It's frustrating whether than aiding. And the other thing that I think needs to be remembered, China started reform and growing um, when there was little competition from other developing countries. In other words, it's right. lost its competitive advantage. China's becoming expensive. So you see now countries trying to use China's playbook and trying to lure away investments that were, um, you know, originally going to China by offering cheaper labor and, and, and more favorable uh, terms. But I think the other thing that needs to be remembered is domestically the situation has changed drastically. The key is what's called the, demo, the demographic dividend. In other words, China had this amazing abundance of um, labor. It was, uh, you know, they were young and they were cheap. And this was mostly from the countryside. I mean, this is the situation that India has right now. And so that's, you know, India's advantage. But um, that is drying up. And China is now rapidly becoming an aging society. Um, you know, rather than, and it's, it's, and it's facing problems with low birth rates, like many other countries in the world. And so China is, is essentially getting old before it gets rich. So it's unclear whether it's going to be able to escape the middle income trap. Um, and then in terms of, uh, does it have the, the human capital? Um, experts like, you know, Scott Rosell and Li Hongbin and others are showing that, in fact, there's a human capital deficit. And particularly in poor rural areas where there is labor, um, it's unclear that those kids are being adequately trained uh, to really allow China to go up the value ladder. So, you know, that's, that, those two changing conditions, I think, really argue that you can't take for granted that China's going to be able to keep this growth up. And it's already clear, even before COVID, that the new normal was that this is a, a you know, slowing growth. And then um, let me just say one other thing. Um, the, and, and here, it's the, you know, I said that there are, you know, the two things that allowed China to, to grow. One was, the, you know, the international and, and domestic context. But, but two, that China was able to get a lot of mileage without really engaging in thorough reform. And the question is, and, and this is much less clear, but the question is how much further can they go with this model that actually was created, as you know, you know for a centrally planned economy. Right. Um, you know, and so what they did was that the, up until this point, and she included, they're basically kicking the can down the road. They did the easy reforms, and so that everything is left now are the really tough decisions that are going to challenge the core principles of this, you know, this socialist system that they say they are still leading. And the, the, the what we, I think, is very worrisome in terms of trying to, to say, well, you know, for China, is it going to go forward, is that they, she doesn't seem to be making any moves to suggest that he's going to actually tackle these hard decisions. Instead, instead, you know, for the volume, we use this term 
going back to the future. In other words, they are resuscitating um, you know, practices, institutions that we haven't seen since the Mao period. They're returning to politics, re-centralizing control, you know, making people engage in all sorts of political ritual, you know, making sure that people are studying she's thought uh, rather than uh, investing in um, institutional change. And I'll just stop here and turn it over to Tom to talk about the sort of the ambitions part of it. Okay, Tom, over to you. Yeah, thank you. That, uh, let me summarize what Jean has said in, in the book with the, uh, the, the phrase from stock brochures. Past achievement is no guarantee of future performance. And the unstoppable juggernaut image is based on China's accomplishments under much more favorable conditions, as Gene described. Right. But we're not, we're not predicting, none of our authors predict that the, the wheels are going to fall off, China is going to fail, the Communist Party state will collapse. But it's also uh, not going to keep roaring ahead with the economic uh, success and social stability that it has had. Does, does China have lofty ambitions? Yes. Uh, like Stanford, it would like to be number one. I thought we were number one. <laughs> yeah, 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 hold on. China does not aspire to be the we try harder. Right, the right. Company. Uh, they've set a goal for themselves of achieving high levels of, of educational, technical, uh, health standards, and international influence. Does that mean they have serious short-term intentions, aspirations to dethrone the United States, to assume a larger responsibility for maintenance and direction of the international system? My answer to that is no. That uh, aspiration does not automatically translate into achievement. China aspires to be a high income country with all of the capabilities that are associated with being a high income country. That China's miracle growth plateaued before it had reached high income status. That makes right. China different than all of the other Asian tigers, all of which carried miracle growth into high income status. The importance of that is, is more than the symbolic label. It's the ability to manage multiple budgetary demands, conflicting social requirements and expectations and demands much more easily than a less developed state it can be. China's aspirations in the international system uh, have changed over the 40 years of reform. It entered with a determination roughly analogous to George Washington's no entangling alliance. That it was a classic big power not wanting to be ensnared by the Lilliputian states by being caught up in a rules-based order, international control regimes, with the exception of the United Nations, uh, where uh, they became a member in 1971 and participated in most of the subcomponents. But the attitude evolved from one of trying to avoid as many uh, constraints and requirements of the rules based order, the liberal international order, as possible, but gradually and grudgingly accepting more of them as necessary to sustain economic growth. Right. Uh, over time, they wanted a seat at the table for understandable reasons, more than just national pride, largely for defensive reasons, to make sure that th decisions were not made that could have an adverse impact on China. Again, over time, they came to see, they wanna have a role in making decisions. They wanna put ideas on the table because they have come to recognize increasingly that it's sometimes advantageous for China to pursue its objectives by working, continuing to work with and through the international order. So they have no intention or ambition or prospect 
of overthrowing that order from which they have benefited enormously. That the final point I'll make about their ambition is the number one ambition uh, is continued economic progress because it's critical to regime stability, it's critical to meeting the expectations of the populace. It's impossible, I would say, for, speaking for myself, I think it's a fair conclusion from uh, the contributors to the book that China cannot do that unless it remains an active, responsible stakeholder, however one defines that, in the international system. It needs the international order in order to achieve its higher priority domestic objectives. And the idea that it would do things militarily, uh, politically, diplomatically, that would have an adverse effect on the ability to sustain economic growth, I think is just hard, hard to defend. Interesting. Well, that gets me to the second question related. Uh, the very title of your book, in fact, has a hypothesis embedded in it. Uh, when you say fateful decisions, choices that will shape China's future, uh, that implies that individuals matter, that leaders matter, that they have choices. Uh, both of you know that there are, there's another school of thought. In fact, Professor Steve Walt at Harvard just published a piece a few days ago saying it's all about power, structural conditions, and that makes conflict, by the way, with the United States inevitable because there's two powers clashing. So help us understand how you weigh the, the balance between the role that individuals play, President Xi himself, the role that the party plays, the Communist Party, versus these more impersonal factors. Tom, I guess we'll start with you. Yeah, uh, Steve, Steve Walt is a friend. I think he's wrong. Okay, that, that, the, friends the can book, be wrong. <laughs> friends can be wrong. That, that, that the book is in part um, a reaction against projection of what China will be like and how it will act that are based on kind of overarching general theories of how authoritarian states act, how rising states act, how states act when they achieve a certain level of economic capability or military power. From our experience, and I think that of the contributors, all of whom have worked with and on China for a long time and worked with Chinese counterparts for a long time, uh, they don't spend a lot more time than any other nationality does and the leaders of China and my interaction don't spend a lot of time with brand theory and gaming things out that as uh, one of my State Department colleagues uh, put it one time uh, that long-term stuff is is very interesting but I'm up to my ass and alligators and I have to decide <laughs> which one to shoot first uh -huh. uh, China's leaders deal in a more ad hoc way than most of the grand theories of international politics posit. That uh, leaders matter, but our, my argument, to some extent, the argument of others, but I don't want to um, impute that because few others dealt with it in the book, that the decisions that leaders make um, uh, cumulatively will shape where China goes. But we asked our contributors to look at the areas that they knew best, not to uh, speculate beyond that. But the way in which leadership, that combination of individuals, strong leaders, in the, the Xi, the Standing Committee, the Politburo, the party uh, more broadly, but also the economic leaders, the academic leaders, the opinion shapers, the way they perceive challenges and problems and opportunities, the way they prioritize them, the way they evaluate alternative measures to address those problems, the one that's, uh, that command attention immediately as a lot of health-related, stability-related questions have as a result of COVID-19. Uh, they, not by design, that has to have moved closer to the top of the decision-making agenda. Responding to it will take resources, budgetary and other resources, which then will not be available to do certain other things. 
that the challenges that we look at in the book and lots that we didn't look at all have interested constituencies, all have elites that are powerful, influential, have a stake in the decisions that are made and have the capacity to make their views known. They exercise political leverage, exercise economic leverage. That we start the book with Alice's, Alice Miller's uh, examination of Xi Jinping's, the sources of Xi Jinping's power. Right. Uh, uh, which is basically Xi Jinping was put in position he's in to do certain things mandated by the party leadership. It's not him dictating what happens, it's him acting as their agent. Now the challenges that they face are not just numerous, they're also hard and they're interconnected. That dealing with some of the rural urban discrepancies is gonna be necessary to deal with the secondary education deficiencies that affect 50% of China's future workforce that lives in the countryside. Better education in the countryside requires better health, which requires better health care, which requires some better insurance system in there. So there, there's no inescapable, obvious, best answer uh, to the questions that China faces. There's no ideologically or state of uh, development mandated answer to such questions as what's the proper way to allocate the costs of health care among families, workplaces, local governments, and the national government. But the decisions that are made on how to allocate it, if more of it is shoved onto individual families, that affects consumer spending. Uh, it reduces discretionary income. If you do it more at the state level, uh, national level, you've got less money available for defense or belt and road type projects. That so on, the choices that they make of how to optimize the efficacy of decisions and how to minimize the downsides of making mistaken decisions and how to recognize that a decision isn't producing the desired effects and then turning around the aircraft carrier of the ship of state so she can say, I got it wrong. We have to do something different. So that's why we put the emphasis on decisions and not on structures or not on states of development or other things. Right. Let me, um, Jean, go ahead. You wanted to add something? Go ahead. Yeah. I just want to uh, say another way, another perspective that um, we try to um, underscore the importance of another perspective is that I think too many people assume that China as one of the, you know, is seen as sort of the strongest one party authoritarian states, right? And, and they, I think a lot of, of, of uh, people assume that the Chinese leaders would have the autonomy just to make decisions, i.e. without thinking about constraints. And in this volume, we spent a lot of time asking each of the authors to look at what are the constraints, what are the right. institutional constraints that may be shaping the decisions that China has or hasn't made. And I think this is something that is often missed. And I think this is one of the reasons why, for example, and I think this has implications for what, for example, the US wants China to do with, for example, SOE reform. It's not a simple uh, decision that they get rid of SOEs. There are all sorts of political, and here I would say ideological uh, constraints that prevent um, China from making certain reforms. And this is one of the reasons why they've been kicking the can down the road. And the fact that they haven't made these reforms, and because of the fact, as Tom said, so many of these reforms are interconnected, it is such a messy and dangerous politically uh, situation that they try to just, you know, not do it and find circuitous routes um, out 
of the short term problem. Right. And, and so this is a situation where Xi Jinping has all these problems, but you know, one, and, and it's sort of like whack-a-mole. They, they, they take care of one problem, but a new problem pops up. And then they're going to take care of that one. And then it keeps moving. And then something like COVID happens. And all of a sudden, you know, they say, oh, gee, guess we got to really focus on health and things like this. So I think this institutional constraint, we should not underplay that in China, even though they don't have things like elections. I want to stress that there is a constituency, there is an you know, increasing citizen demand and expectations, which also factor into how this is going to complicate the challenges that the leaders are facing. Well, maybe my last question is about uh, what do you both think are some of the most fateful consequential decisions? So we've talked about reform. I love this phrase, by the way, in your book, deep water reform, right? That's a great imagery. Um, and maybe that, that those are in that domain, it's the decisions they're not willing to take because of the yes. institutional constraints you're talking about. But I'm also curious that, you know, leaders can make good decisions. They can make bad decisions. They can miscalculate. Um, many people worry about, China today uh, overextending themselves uh, internationally uh, through the Belt and Road Initiative or the new security law in Hong Kong. Uh, that is a story I know well when I think of the last uh, decades of the Soviet Union where they didn't make the hard dis decisions domestically, but they did do these more um, uh, risky behaviors externally and we know how that story ended. What, if you had to just boil it down to one or two what are some of the biggest, most consequential decisions? Maybe one on the domestic side, one on the foreign. Uh, Tom, we'll start with you and Jean will get the last word. Yeah, I won't divide it quite in the uh, domestic, uh, ex external, but I, I'll take the bundle as my most consequential, the bundle of decisions that they make around sustaining economic growth. Okay. They've got to sustain <clears throat> adequate growth to meet in some satisfactory way, the rising needs and expectations and demands uh, of the population. The Chinese public are no longer, if they ever were, uh, kind of blue ants, um, uh, willing to comply with anything that comes out of Beijing or party center. That, as I said earlier, miracle growth is over. The international environment is much more competitive and challenging and a lot less accommodating. Part of that is because of China's success. A lot of it is because of China's ham-handed actions. They've managed to alienate, give or take, every country and major player in the international system. It's not irretrievable, right? but it makes it harder to follow the export-led growth model that they have pursued. That the legitimacy of the regime, social stability is based overwhelmingly on sustained performance, delivery of tangible benefits to this very large population. Two thirds of that population <clears throat> has no memory of anything other than sustained growth. Their entire life experience is one that teaches them that lofty ambitions are reasonable, uh, that right. the government is capable of meeting their expectations, and that if it's not, it's because of corruption or incompetence or some other reason. China is still a middle-income country, uh, it, though it aspires to be a wealthy country. It's important to remember China's GDP, large as it is, and on a per capita basis, is below the world average. Uh, China's GDP per capita has gone up about $10,000 in the last 40 years. Uh, for comparison, the U.S. GDP per capita went up in excess of $50,000 in that same period. In some respects, the gap is widening. That as China struggles, really, it will struggle to meet the demands and expectations of 
its people, it ultimately falls back on its economic, the wisdom, the success of its economic policies and the foreign policy and ultimately the security policy is key to advancing those economic objectives. I'll let you talk about some of the structural and internal. Go ahead, Jean. Last word to you. All right. Well, I agree that um, one of the most important challenges is maintaining the economic growth. But for me, I think the greatest challenge, and this has been a challenge for all leaders going back to, well, all back to Mao, and that is what is the balance between control of the localities and autonomy for the localities? Because I think the greatest challenge is to ensure that the local state agents who have been responsible for China's very rapid growth over the last decades, that they continue to have sufficient incentives to um, be entrepreneurial and to really spearhead this growth. And one of the things that has happened is that um, the current uh, leadership has really changed the political context. Um, I think that we're familiar with this idea that, you know, local officials, there are a lot of them that are sitting on their hands and you have to ask, well, why are they all of a sudden sitting on their hands? The anti-corruption campaign has made it too difficult, too, too dangerous actually for localities to be entrepreneurial. And so um, I think a big challenge is how does he, on the one hand, control Corruption, indeed, there was corruption, but most importantly, how do you keep local officials wanting to be local officials? Because we already have reports of some of them leaving people not wanting to take the civil service exam. Right. Um, and, and that, you know, people are scared to death because they get dragged off in the middle of, you know, public um, meetings. They're, they're handcuffed and dragged off. And so, you know, it, there's a lot of people are wondering, um, is it, is this what I want to do? And I think that um, this, uh, and particularly as they're going back to the future, as we say, and relying on uh, ideology, re-centralized control, that it's stifling this uh, entrepreneurial spirit that's at the core of the China growth model. Um, so that for me, this is something that I think they have got to um, uh, really figure out. So that, uh, to me, that's one of the biggest dangers. Wow. I would not want to be a leader in China today, listening to exactly. both of you speak. These are really hard questions. And I also feel like looking at this, this very deep, complex volume, we've just touched the surface. I think maybe we'll have to have you back with some of your co-authors because complex problems demand complex uh, research. And that's exactly what this book is. I congratulate you both. To remind everybody, the book is called Fateful Decisions, Choices That Will Shape China's Future. I urge you to buy this book because if you don't buy this book, books like this don't get written. Uh, congratulations to you both. And I guarantee you we'll have you back for another edition of World Class to dig deeper into these set of problems. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. You've been listening to World Class from the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. If you like what you're hearing, please review us on Apple Podcasts. We'd love to know your thoughts. And be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever you're listening to stay up to date on what's happening in the world and why.